Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Submarine History. Today, in briefing number 53, uh, we're going to continue the briefing on torpedo propulsion systems. I have references and links in the description to this briefing. I also have a Discord, and there's an invitation link on the channel banner. If you like the briefing, you can leave a super thanks or consider a channel membership. If you have any questions about the briefing, leave them in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. All right, we ended part one of the briefing uh, talking about compressed air powered piston engines. Now you saw this table uh, in part one. Uh, I've just removed the Howell and Brennan torpedoes since uh, they didn't use compressed air. The takeaway here is that during the time period defined, which is 1885 to 1898, nations were using torpedoes of similar dimensions with compressed air from about 1350 to 2200 PSI which translates into a torpedo speed of about 30 knots and a range out to 1100 yards. It was possible to adjust the airflow regulator inside the torpedo to provide more or less air pressure to the engine. And that's how you'd set your torpedo speed and range. Now something else here. At a glance, you might look at the British Mark V and say, hey, that extra air pressure isn't getting you much. Sure, it's a little faster than the Whitehead, but the range is 20% shorter. Well, if you look again, you'll see that the Mark V is carrying a warhead that's 40% heavier. There was a problem with using compressed air. That problem was that releasing the compressed air from its pressure tank caused the air to expand as it entered the engine, and that air could freeze uh, the pistons in their cylinders, causing the engine to seize up. That phenomena was the result of the adiabatic cooling process, the process of reducing heat through a change in air pressure caused by volume expansion. So what was the solution to this problem? Around 1901, engineers began adding experimental air heating devices to, to torpedo engines to prevent the air from freezing, with the additional benefit of the hot air making more power. Patented in 1904 by the William Armstrong Company of England, the Ellswick heater was an early system for heating air in torpedoes. With this system, air and a fuel were injected into a combustion chamber or pot where an igniter would start the thermal reaction. The now superheated air would expand greatly and increase the power available for the engine. And this is referred to as the heater, or later it would be called the dry heater process. Here's a somewhat more complete uh, schematic. What you don't see here uh, are all the other air lines between the regulator and the combustion pot, which send air to various pneumatic systems on the torpedo. And we'll see all that auxiliary piping uh, in a few more slides. There were a variety of fuels uh, used for these heater systems. Uh, the list includes kerosene, methanol, ethanol, decaline, high test peroxide, or HTP, and oxygen. The U.S. started out using kerosene, uh, then moved to ethanol, which was used in the Mark 14. And that's where the expression torpedo juice comes from. And that was U.S. sailors siphoning ethanol from their torpedoes to drink. I've updated the table with the German uh, C03 uh, AVK and uh, US Bliss Levitt Mark I torpedoes for comparison. You can see here, heating that air extends torpedo range out to 4,000 yards compared to 1,000 yards for compressed air torpedoes at similar speeds. Our freezing problem was solved uh, by heating the air. However, that led to a new problem, uh, which was engines running hot and losing efficiency. And this is the same problem that air-cooled internal combustion engines face. That heat problem was solved around 1907 when the British added water to the combustion process. That water managed reaction heat and created steam for the engine, further increasing power. And this is referred to as the wet heater process. We'll use the Mark 14 torpedo as our wet heater example. Uh, while there would be some variation in design and application, every nation in World War II used the wet heater process. You use that process to drive a piston engine or in the case of the US, to spin turbines. Note on the slide, uh, that big tank in the middle of the torpedo conspicuously named air flask. In this close-up view, uh, we see the aft portion of the air flask with the fuel flask immediately behind it. The annular space between the air and fuel flasks is where water is stored, uh, so we're not using seawater. Can't really see the combustion pot or the turbines, uh, but you can see aft of the main engine the exhaust piping that carried the spent steam out through the stern of the torpedo. Here's the combustion pot. 
You can see on the right uh, the points where air, fuel, and water are separately injected into the pot and where the igniter starts the reaction and makes steam. That steam is then fed through a nozzle to the turbines. Here's a cutaway uh, for a Mark 14 that's on display at the USS Cod, uh, a submarine museum ship located in downtown Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Uh, hey, shout out to the volunteer crew who hosted me for an afternoon so I could take some pictures. Fantastic group of guys who do an amazing job maintaining that boat. Probably the best preserved pre-guppy conversion uh, Gato class boat in the United States. So if you're ever in Cleveland, it's a must see. And let me know and I'll try to meet you down at the boat. In this cutaway, uh, we see a portion of the fuel flask, uh, which is the green vessel. The air flask is immediately forward of it. At the bottom of the cutaway, they have labeled the, the piping that leads to the combustion flask, uh, or combustion pot, or combustion chamber. Here they have a turbine labeled, uh, and this is just aft of the fuel and combustion flasks. This picture is uh, aft uh, of the torpedo. In the upper right-hand corner of the cutaway uh, is that turbine from the previous slide. The most prominent feature in this picture is the exhaust piping, and that's that big copper pipe extending aft from the oil tank. Here's a nice complete color schematic uh, of that Mark 14 wet heater system. Uh, air flask pressure is 2800 PSI. Some of that air will pass through a pressure reducer and be returned to the fuel and water flasks to push those liquids out to the combustion flask. Reduced pressure air also powers the depth and steering gears. High pressure air powers the gyro and the starting gear. We've been talking about uh, steam powered turbines and uh, like I said earlier, as far as I know, the U.S. was the only country to use steam turbines in, to in their torpedoes. Every other country used the Brotherhood piston engine or a variation on it. On this slide is a four-cylinder radial engine for the German G7A torpedo. Uh, these photos are from a military antiques auction website. Um, these engines were sold out, uh, but that would have been interesting to see how much money they uh, went for. The British improved the wet heater process by injecting some fuel into each cylinder as the piston approached top dead center. That compression was enough to cause detonation and help drive the piston down and produce more power as in a diesel engine. And they refer to this uh, as a burner cycle engine. Here's our table again uh, with the addition of some representative uh, wet heater torpedoes. Again, uh, you can set these torpedoes to run at different speeds uh, in different distances by adjusting the air pressure delivered to the engine. I've tried to pick similar speeds so you can see the difference in distance. In terms of performance, the British Mark 8 and the Japanese Type 95 Mod 1 are heavy hitters, literally. The British burner cycle and the use of pure oxygen by the Japanese make it possible for them to deliver much heavier payloads at superior speeds and distances versus the Mark 14 and the German G7A. The Type 95 was the submarine version of the Type 93 Long Lance. The high speeds and long distances were achieved by using pure oxygen instead of air, which is only 20.0% oxygen. When the torpedo was launched, it started off using air and then was gradually transitioned to pure oxygen. While the wet heater engine certainly improved the speed and distance of torpedoes, there was still a fundamental problem to be overcome, and that problem was the bubble trail. The use of air resulted in a large visible bubble trail or wake that could easily be seen and tracked during the day and could also be seen at night depending on sea conditions. An electric propulsion system would be the solution that finally solved that torpedo visibility problem. When you think about uh, electric torpedoes in World War II, you're likely going to think about the German G7E torpedo, and you might think it was a very novel or groundbreaking technology at the time. But the truth is that batteries, as a technology, had been around since about 1800, when Italian chemist and physicist uh, Alessandro Volta developed the first practical electrochemical battery. An early battery-powered boat was developed by German-Russian electrical engineer uh, Moritz von Jacobi in 1839. His boat was 24 feet long and could car carry 14 passengers at three knots. On this slide is a picture of a battery-powered, radio-controlled boat developed and patented by Nikola Tesla in 1898. This boat was six feet long and powered by an e-motor with two batteries. Tesla successfully demonstrated the boat on an artificial lake set up in Madison Square Garden shortly after the Spanish-American War. He had hoped to sell the concept for military ap applications, but was unsuccessful. Essentially, it would have been uh, a surface-running torpedo, 
and that would have suffered the same problems uh, with that form factor. Notably, your enemy sees it coming and has time to react and counter the threat. But it did successfully demonstrate the potential of battery and e-motor technologies as it applied to a marine environment. Here it is, uh, the G7E electric torpedo. It entered service with the Kriegsmarine in 1936. It had two 60-volt lead-acid batteries connected in series uh, to power a 110-volt DC e-motor that developed about 100 horsepower. Its performance was uh, 5,470 uh, yards at 30 knots. This was not Germany's first uh, rodeo with electric torpedoes. They had developed a G7 prototype electric torpedo back in 1917. The Japanese had the Type 92 electric torpedo, uh, which they had started to develop in the early 1920s and was inspired by Germany's G7 electric torpedo from World War I. Design work was completed in 1934, but not seeing an immediate need for it, the design was set aside until 1942 when the Japanese attempted to produce it in quantity but were unsuccessful because of manpower shortages. The British Mark uh, 11 torpedo was a copy of the G7E. It entered service in 1944 but never really reached a uh, production scale. The U.S. Mark 18 torpedo was also a copy of the G7E. The U.S. had looked at electric propulsion for torpedoes as, uh, as early as 1915. They started throwing resources at the development of an electric torpedo after World War I and spent about 12 years developing the Mark I electric torpedo, but they dropped that uh, project in 1931 due to uh, lack of funding. Work on the project was resumed in 1941 and uh, proceeded slowly until the U.S. was able to get a G7E when they decided to copy as much as they could uh, from it for their own torpedo. Production Mark 18s began to end service uh, in the spring of 1943. There were a lot of design and production problems uh, that didn't get resolved until 1944, but once the problems were ironed out, uh, the skippers accepted it and the Mark 18 became the weapon of choice. Footnote, electric torpedoes were much simpler to design and build versus steam-powered torpedoes, uh, and they were less expensive. As always, uh, there are pluses and minuses with each new technology and electric torpedoes are no different. The pluses were a very quiet torpedo that left no discernible bubble trail. But they were slower and they had less range uh, than steam-powered torpedoes. You also had to periodically recharge them and you had to warm up the batteries to get the best performance. That's what we're looking at here uh, on these graphs. On the left are the performance curves for an unheated uh, G7E. There are four curves, watts, volts, amps, and RPMs. The RPM curve uh, is what's highlighted because that's what's most important. You want the propellers running at a constant speed throughout the run. You have to have that or your TDC calculations are meaningless. The RPM curve is pretty flat out to 1,000 meters and then it starts to drop off and then dramatically towards 5,000 meters. On the right are the performance curves for a G7E whose batteries have been warmed up to 33 degrees centigrade. That RPM is pretty flat out to 2,000 meters, and then it starts to taper slowly uh, to about 4,000 meters. It would take a couple hours to warm up the batteries, uh, and you could do that while they were in the tubes. And then another downside is that, you know, because they use lead-acid batteries, uh, when you recharge them, you had to ventilate the compartment or the tube uh, because of the danger of hydrogen gas, just like, when a subs own, just like with the subs own lead-acid batteries. And then our final chart with the G7E specs at the bottom. So as you can see, uh, the G7E had less than half the range of the G7A. Um, I don't show the Mark 18, but its performance was 4,000 yards at 29 knots, so comparable to the uh, G7E. Okay, uh, well, we made it to the end of this two-part series. I hope you enjoyed this briefing. Uh, it was a really interesting subject. Leave your questions and comments below. And uh, hey, come out to the Submarine History Discord and say hi. Till next time, peace out.